happy too that we get to see the faces of the people on Zoom if you feel like turning your camera on. But I'm gonna start by asking the question that I've asked, um, let's see, probably close to more than 50 times in the last two years, which is how and why did you decide to make your life in art? Uh, in 2015, well, I first entered the Clay Studio in 1993 um, with no Clay experience, uh, prior Clay experience other than my seventh grade art teacher. Um, but I knew that I wanted to create and I didn't know that I wanted to sell, but I definitely wanted to create. Um, and in 2015, I found myself unemployed and I came back to the Clay Studio, took a class and I touched uh, Jen Martin's shoulder and I said, I want to work for the clay studio. <laughs> and it just so happened that the person who was doing the clay mobile was leaving Katie and I got her position. So I now help run the clay mobile program. That is a great um, example of putting what you want out into the universe. Yes. <laughs> and Jen Martin believes in that strongly as well. You just have to kind of say it and, and work, still work hard for it to come true. Um, so Nitsa Waleska is a Claymobile teacher here at the Clay Studio. For those of you who don't know, um, as she said, she started taking classes here in 1993 and then came back as a staff member and now helps run that program and has the first featured artist spot down in um, the gallery of our new building. Nitsa is also a neighbor and has um, really been a huge help also on our Making Place Matter Council. So that's been really wonderful for me um, working on that project for the last two years. So thank you for all of that work with us. Um, another thing that people who have been on the Assumption Learns might know is that we usually, I do a little test conversation beforehand. So I'll, I'll often say like, well, when we talked yesterday, um, there was that the, that moment that you really felt empowered to do this as a career, you talked about when you kind of tapped John Martin on mm -hmm. the shoulder, but um, I guess I'm excited to hear you also talk about when you felt empowered that your artwork was ready to um, kind of be taken, when you felt it was moving to the next level. So we've talked about that a little bit over the last few years and how that came to be. But I wanted to, again, I am uh, trained by the instructors of the Clay Studio. Um, I'm not academically trained in any college. Um, so Daniel taught me a lot, and I took a one-time workshop on how to stack, how to grow bigger with Nate. Um, because I couldn't go much taller than this cup in throwing. And I wanted to go taller so that I could have more surface to carve. Um, this was one of my first pieces that I joined prior to uh, COVID. And then during the lockdown, I wasn't working uh, my three jobs because I work here and then I work part time in two other jobs. I wasn't working my three jobs. So my world slowed down, the world slowed down. So I was able to get taller and wider. My goal was to, to make um, rounder bellies and to make them grow taller. Um, and with the workshop, I learned how to make two cylinders and stack them. My my bellies are always two bowls that I stack. Um, Nate stacks his work wet. I have learned, I altered his training and what I learned from him, and I stack mine leather hard. So I wait for my pieces to get a little bit harder, and then I stack them. Um, because for me, my pieces are a little bit heavier than, than what Nate throws, because I need the extra clay to carve. So if I, if I stack them while they're still wet, the bottom um, caves in. Mm -hmm. So I learned, <laughs> trial and error, um, just to let them you know, dry out a little bit. And the, most of them are six pieces mm -hmm. that are thrown individually and then stacked. Mm -hmm. And then the handles are all extruded. And the handles, I just love making the handles. And the handles, for me, represent, if you ever have visited the island of Puerto Rico, they, the Puerto Ricans there are really proud of their iron work that are in front of their houses. Um, their raw iron work is beautiful. And each house is different. And every year they scrape them, they paint them, but they're just so proud 
of their iron work that's in front of their houses. So my handles are to represent some of the iron work and some of the um, gates that are in um, the houses in Puerto Rico. Um, well, and that, that's interesting because houses in some ways are kind of like vessels. Yeah. Right. yeah, and these vessels to me represent women. To me, they look like women. They look like strong women. I come from a family of strong women. My mother is a very strong woman. Um, my great grandmother um, and my grandmother, um, all very strong women. So for me, the vessels are to represent the women that come from my family. I think that ties really nicely into, uh, I, I often ask why clay? And I know it's partially because of your art teacher in seventh grade, but there must, can you talk a little bit about like why you think clay as a material speaks to you? Yes, yes. The indigenous people of the island of Puerto Rico, the Tainos, um, my, my mission right now is to share their culture, to share you know, the, the people that came from the island. So they did a lot of carvings. They left a lot of imagery. They didn't leave, um, they didn't have alphabets A through Z. Um, but they left a lot of pictures. You can still see them. You can still feel them in the in the in the caves that you can go to. Um, some of the rocks still have the carvings, um, and it's just important for me as a brown-faced Puerto Rican artist. There aren't many coming from North Philly, uh, and it's just important. As soon as you see my vessels, I want people to ask about the carvings so that I can introduce the indigenous people of the island. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that, um, but partially in. You were telling me about who taught you about Taiwan. Yes, my mother. Yeah, the school district, I came through the school district of Philadelphia. I went through many schools because of gentrification, I moved. So from kindergarten through 12, I counted, and I went through seven schools um, because we just had to move from Spring Garden to Poplar Street. And now um, we ended up in Kensington, and I've been in this area since the third grade. Uh, I've seen it go up, I've seen it go down, and now it's up and it's really high and it's really expensive. Um, but I was one that in the 90s, when this neighborhood was not so popular and it was not good, uh, I was one that stayed. A lot of residents moved to the Northeast, um, but I was one that stayed. I thought, I thought it was important for our children to see positive people walking out of their houses with jobs, whatever it was. Um, and again, as soon as you became a firefighter or a police officer or a teacher, you got a good job and you just left the neighborhood. And I didn't. I stayed. I got married, divorced, worked for the city, worked for many places, and I just stayed in the neighborhood. I thought it was really important for our children to see to see that. Um, I started a play studio in the neighborhood. I had two children's classes and an adult class. It was through Nard Square Civic Association, um, and it was the Beacon program. It was to serve the at-risk youth from 5 to 7 p.m. Um, when the parents are just coming home from school. Um, and it was a really good program, and it ended because of funding. Mm -hmm. And then I came back, after that ended, then I came back to the play studio. And I'm just gonna keep pushing that connection a little bit because your mom had a lot to do with that same idea of like activism through yes. making the, you know, contributing to the community like yes. you were doing. Yes. But there's also, you told me that um, you would come back, it was hard for you to stay clean in your good clothes because you were busy playing in the mud mm -hmm. and your mother created all these gardens. I feel like there's this really wonderful connection between she's a strong woman, you looked up to her, her gardening, you were playing in the garden mm -hmm. and then that kind of mm -hmm. um, turned into a love for clay like maybe that's part of what when you touched clay you were thinking about yeah definitely my mom um, is a very uh, strong influence in me being the Puerto Rican woman that I am um, the, again the school district of Philadelphia did not teach me about being a Puerto Rican my mother taught me um, you know every Saturday morning we would wake up cleaning and we had salsa music in the background um, and she Worked for a Norris Square neighborhood project, and in the early 90s, she would take neighborhood children that were that had Puerto Rican parents, but the children never went to Puerto Rico. And it was called the Puerto Rican experience. So um, my mother has always, you know, taught me who I am, why I am, you know, why I look the way I look, why I speak the way that I speak, what why I eat what I eat. Um, and it all has been an influence from my mother. 
And she is a gardener, well, she was a gardener for Norris Green Neighborhood Project. And in that neighborhood, she has created an African garden, there's a Puerto Rican garden, and there's a garden dedicated to the Tainos. Mm. So she's, she's sharing the culture with the gardening and the plants, and I'm sharing the culture with my pots. Yeah, it's an amazing legacy and another strong woman to keep, keep it going. Um, so you went to Puerto Rico with your family and you saw those houses and you saw yes. all those things and that's mm -hmm. part of what you brought back. I know um, you were telling me about a woman who's, um, who you, I, I think you saw a video of her making yes. Taino inspired. Yes, I definitely want to go visit her. She is in Morovis, in the town Morovis, and I saw a video clip, and it's new because the person who's video, who is interviewing her has a mask. Oh, so but there is a person in the town, and they happen to see her, and she is beautiful, and she's very dark, and she has really long black hair, and the person that saw her said, I need to take your DNA. And when they took her DNA, they came back and she's 99.9% Taino. And she creates pottery the indigenous way. She has the clay in the yard, she fires in the yard, and she learned from her mother and her grandmother. And this woman is still alive, and yes, I want to go to Puerto Rico to spend a week with this woman. We're putting this into the universe. Yes. So that it, yeah, we can manifest it. What's in real. Yeah, I, 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 I have, have to, video. Oh, oh, we'll I share it later. Yeah, we yes, have, have to, to connect to yeah. that. Yeah. It's in Spanish. But it's an amazing video. Um, okay, so I'm going to switch to showing some images. So we can talk about that, and yep. then we'll get to your process. Okay. Um, thank you for bearing with me, everyone. There are so many little squares up on my screen right now. What is happening? <laughs> Okay, so um, here's an image of Nitsa in action, and um, that's your seventh grade yes, teacher? Yes, my seventh grade, seventh grade teacher, Mr. Alan Foreman. Mm -hmm. I went to Conwell Middle Magnet School, mm -hmm. and this this was not part of our art class. Um, and I, I invited him to the opening, and I asked him, Mr. Foreman, what was that? And he said that he had extra time in his roster, and he pulled about seven children and I was one of them. And it wasn't after school because I was not allowed. I was not allowed to stay after school. Um, so I don't know if it was during maybe our lunch. I don't know. But anyway, he brought in a baby kiln, a, a test kiln, and he brought fired clay. And I remember we made a fish mobile. We made some kind of dial. But the way that Mr. Foreman presented our work back to us, I remember the fish mobile. He just didn't give it. He just didn't give the fish mobile back to us. Um, he he uh, mounted it on a board and he put the little cork pieces and I remember my mom displayed it in the bathroom. But just the care that he took in giving us back the work, um, just, yeah. I just knew as an adult I wanted to play with Clyde because of Mr. Foreman. Mm -hmm. That's really special. Um, and it's so full circle because it's what you give to children now. Yeah, yeah. yeah with the Claymobile. That's why Claymobile is so important to me because in essence, that was Claymobile back then, you know, and I see the effects, how it affected me and how I create. So I see the potential in all of the children when we go out for Claymobile. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so here's an image of the uh, other types of work that Netza makes. Um, and I... <laughs> Nitsa has a really good Instagram account. So basically, I just took all these pictures from her Instagram. Um, but it helps show the different processes and the stages. Um, but, but something that's really interesting to me is that they're so your decorative um, patterning is so related to textiles. Yes, yes. My mother was uh, a seamstress, um, a pretend, if you ask her, she's a pretend seamstress. She still has her sewing machine. But I clearly remember going into second grade, into first grade, no kindergarten, I was in spring garden kindergarten, my mother would make me an outfit every night. Oh, wow. Every yes. night? It was just a tube top and pants. No <laughs> pockets, just elastic around the middle. But by the end of the day, the teachers would have to staple and <laughs> run around all my, all my scenes because everything was falling apart. But I come, but I remember, and my mother still has a house full of fabric. 
But I remember as a child um, going to Woolworths. If you remember Woolworths off of Chestnut Street, off of Market Street, I remember, and she was always, let's go to the telas. We have to go to La Sección de las Telas. I'm like, mom, don't you have enough telas? <laughs> so I started creating bowls um, and tiles um, to represent all of the telas, all of the fabric that um, I have witnessed <laughs> through, through my life. And my grandmother was also a seamstress, and she used to uh, do uh, embroidery. Beautiful, um, her tablecloths were embroidered. Got it. Yeah. Well, and you um, you had a great skirt on at the opening. Yes. Yeah. Um, and this one, to me, has some kind of, I mean, it still has some, somewhat fabric, but it's like yeah, grass or plants sort of mm -hmm. in the background. And did you do this one before these? That one is the last one I made on Second Street. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And it's the only one that has color. Yeah. Um, and I, I haven't glazed it. It's in, in my house, bisque. Uh, I haven't glazed it because I don't ever want my work to be shiny. I don't never want my work to look brand new. Mm. So I haven't figured out what glaze I'm gonna. And that's, that's another reason why I usually don't apply colors to my tall vases because I, I again, um, I don't ever want them to be shiny. And this black glaze that's on these pieces is the black glaze here from the clay studio. And it's located on the second floor and I love it. It's low fire, you brush it on. And I just, and the pieces just look old. It makes it look metallic and it makes the handles look like wrought iron. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You need to hide. You can go. <laughs> I, I'll tell you after, I have a clearish glaze that fits in shiny. Okay. Um, yeah, no, people, I mean, we'll have questions at the end too, but if you have a question or a comment, feel free. Um, yeah, I thought it was interesting that this is one of these pieces, but it has more color, and I was wondering what you were thinking about mm -hmm. that. So. Um, so another thing that Nitsa does is make jewelry. So I'm wearing my special piece from Nitsa here today, and then we have one on the form. So this, and this one is this great example of the fabric with one of your pieces. So do you want to talk about that one a little bit? Yes. The first clay pendant um, I created uh, because I was asked to create something small for what small fingers. And I thought, what can I make that small? And I thought, clay pendants. The first ones were stamped. So I rolled out a slab of clay and I stamped them out with different cookie cutter shapes. And I thought, okay, cool, that's cute. But the second series, I wanted them to be more organic. And I wanted them to represent more my work and to represent my handles. So all of these are extruded. I got a handheld gun extruder and they're all formed differently. And then I, I have a, a neighbor that sews all of my fabric. She's an awesome, her name is Blanca. Um, uh, she's an awesome seamstress and she makes all of the fabrics. And then some of them are hung off of leather. And then um, Jen Martin, this is still the 104 low fire terracotta. Jen Martin taught me to, to, to fire it to cone five. And cone five turns it into this chocolatey color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I fire it to cone six, but six is a little, it makes it a little bubbly. So I leave it at cone five and they turn really pretty and chocolatey. Mm -hmm. They're available in the shop. Yes. In case you were wondering. <laughs> um, so here's a few more of them. Um, and you know, continuing that conversation with the textile like patterning on that says bowls, which I think we're gonna get some more bowls in the yes. shop yes. soon. Yep. So that's exciting. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to show a few examples of the different kinds of decorative patterns and surface treatments that um, Nitsa uses. Oh, those are on top of each other, oops. Um, this is to show that, um, you know, you're thinking about the bottom as much as you are yes. on the top. Which yep. is yep. So and important. all of my bowls have feet. Daniel, Mr. Daniel, I took, when I came back in 2015, I was taking his Monday morning class and he taught us how to create feet. So all of my bowls have feet. Yeah, they're so. Um, okay, so now we can talk a little bit about specific Taino symbols, and then we're going to, um, Nitz is going to talk to us about the larger pieces from her show, and then do some, some demonstration. Yes, yes. So when I was asked to be part of the opening exhibition, it was really important for me, for the ex for my part of the exhibition, to speak on me as a Puerto Rican woman. So these vests, or what it is to be a Puerto Rican woman, these vessels 
um, are the three races. Puerto Ricans are three races in one. We are the indigenous people that lived on the island, the Tainos. We are the Spaniards, Christopher Columbus, and Christopher Columbus brought over um, slaves. So the first vessel here has four Taino symbols. Again, the Tainos didn't have alphabet A through Z. They left a lot of imagery, and they celebrated a lot of suns. So this one here is a sun, and this one is a crab. This is another one of their suns. Um, Oh. And I named this one Taina Juisa. So the indigenous people, the, their chiefs for the, for, for the most part were males. And this is the only female noted in the, in the history. Her name is Juisa. So this is why I named this one Taina Juisa. And this one is dedicated to Spain. And Spain introduced lace to Puerto Rico. And there is a museum in Moca, Puerto Rico, that's dedicated for, to the creations of lace. And it's really cool. It has the little sticks. And it's, a, it's an intricate, it's a beautiful. So, and this one is carved differently on each side. So the pattern, this one, and then there's a pattern on this one. And then the handles are also carved. So hopefully when you see this one, you will think of lace. And then this one, I created um, in honor of the Africans. So this one is called Loisa Brown. And Loisa, Puerto Rico is the hometown where my mother is. And if you go to, when I went to Loisa at the age of 18, um, I was shocked on how many brown faces and brown people were all concentrated in that town. And Loisa, Puerto Rico has the highest concentration of African descendants. So this one is dedicated to them. And this one here is the first one, one of the first ones that I stacked, right? I took Nate's workshop on stacking before COVID and this one, is, this one I created, and this one is just two pieces. And again, during the lockdown, I wanted bellies, right? I wanted more voluptuous bellies, and I wanted to go taller. So from this, practicing, 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 that's my results. And then this is one of the bowls, again, fabric inspired. And this one here is one of my first pieces that I created in 93. And although it has a huge crack on the bottom, I signed my name across the whole bottom because that's how proud. That's how proud. That's how, uh, how proud I was. But I take this one again. I teach here, and I teach in two other locations. And I take this one with me wherever I teach. It's really important for us to, you know, appreciate what our hands can create. And just note that from here, you can get to here. Um, I've done it as a full time, working full time and also a parent, right? I have a 27 year old. So obviously when I started in 93 and in 95, she was born, um, but I've done it working a full time job. And I create these at nighttime. I create them after five and I create them on Saturdays and Sundays. So I'm here, you know, to, to, sh to, be, a, to be a witness, to share, to say, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Over. I just felt like that needed applause. <laughs> um, so we, um, Nitsa has her own worksheets here with some Taino symbols, and just so that people at home could see more easily, I, I put one up here that has a few of the same ones. And um, on the right side, there are some images of pottery from, um, those are at the Metropolitan, and then these are at the Taino Museum in Puerto Rico. So you get to see a little bit of the, the echoes of similarity and, and the carvings. handles and the carvings and, mm -hmm. and things like that. So that's exciting. Um, so some images, although we're going to get to see this live in a minute. And just uh, these are some of the pieces. I think this is the one that's still downstairs. Or is that a different one? That one, that's one a cracked. That one cracked. Okay. Well, there it is. And it's in Oh, it's, that's a good image. That's this that, one. That right? shows how I... After I create my handles, uh, uh, Clay has a memory, I learned. <laughs> clay has a memory. And I roll my coils, and the clay wants to lay back flat. So after I roll, roll my coils on some of the other vessels, I'll see that they're trying to unravel. So while they're drying, I will make tight bands and keep my, my cinnamon buns or my <laughs> hand, you know, nice and tight as they're drying. Because I will get cracks in between, and that's something that... I learned trial and error. Yeah. Yeah. Practice. Um, I don't have 
finished images of the two planters that are in the exhibition downstairs, but this is a um, when it was in process. And these are great. They have holes in the bottom and they hang on the wall and they're just really amazing um, examples of, you know, similar to these larger pieces, but with a different function. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that was an upgrade, right? Because before, when I would make the wall hangings, it was just a pot that I would slice in half and put it, and put it back. And Jen Martin <laughs> came upstairs and she said, why do I see flat? Why do I see them on the shelf? And give me a piece of paper, give me a marker. And she drew and she said, they need to be more fluid. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so that one I created, I remember it was uh, July 4th. I was at the studio by myself. And that's just one piece that I had to slice in half. But someone, if I'm slicing the vessel in half, someone has to be there to catch the two pieces as I'm slicing them. And I'm thinking, oh, who's here? Kevin walks in. Kevin! <laughs> Kevin helped me as I sliced them. He held both pieces together for me. And then I attached the slab. But those forms, um, you know, I, I, I'm here. I love the Clay Studio because you can get so much information from staff. Again, this shape uh, uh, came, became this shape because of Jen Martin. My handles, attaching my handles, my lovely jar of vinegar, which I'll talk about later, mm -hmm. is another example. And this is a good example of how I, after the pieces are drying, do you notice the one in the back, all the green on the handle? Mm -hmm. That's wax. So I never want my handles to dry out all the way. I never want them to get bone dry because the piece has to dry. And I don't, I don't want the handles to get so dry that they're gonna get brittle or too dry that I now can't put the piece inside of the, of the kiln. So this one today, I'll, after five o'clock, I'll come back and I'll wax all of the handles and I'll use the green wax. So it'll keep the moisture in the handle and they won't dry out, bone, bone, they won't get bone dry. Mm. Um, so this was a, a, something like the fun day when you called me upstairs and said, okay, I'm making pieces for the show and that was, Probably a year ago, yes, because we thought it was going to be in the fall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so this show has been a long time coming, but it was really great to be able to see your process and, and watch you, um, you know, making bigger and more elaborate things and thinking about this exhibition. So, and I just, I love that you came to these four just absolutely show-stopping people walk by and are stopped in their tracks when they see them through the window. Oh, here's the wax. Is that the wax? No, that's and actually glazing. Okay. That's the black glaze. Um, and there's the show, although there are two wall hanging pieces also. So mm -hmm. um, go down and see those as well. And all but one of them is sold, which is very exciting. <laughs> and there is a, a well-known collector in Texas who wanted one and then couldn't decide between two because they're all so amazing and bought two for um, that collection. So that's great. Um, and now just want to show you a few pictures of Claymobile um, and then we'll get to see some technique. But um, I almost put the picture of you in front of the really old Claymobile ben. design van so we could see the difference. And Raymond designed um, the the new claymobile and i think shannon drew the pots if yep. i'm not mistaken so it's a team effort and there's cesar viveros who's another member of our uh, making place matter council and an amazing artist in his own right he, he was uh, working with you on the las parcelas no we actually that was... we actually did a uh, six series at his garden oh his garden which mm -hmm. is um the name iglesias? of his, iglesias garden mm -hmm. right so um like your program that you were talking about that lost funding from the Civic Association. Now, I mean, in small ways, Clay Studio is able to create yes. this kind of programming again. Yes. So that's exciting. And the after school program that's going to start in the fall, I feel like is going to be another big step in that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, mm -hmm. some of the things that Netsis Claymobile students create. I love these. Mm -hmm. I need a soap dish. And that you were really proud of this one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was challenging the high school students at Science Leadership Academy with boxes, identity boxes. So I'm from Philly and I made an I made my box based on Philly. Yeah. That was your example. Okay, so now we're at the end of our slideshow and we are gonna switch back and 
And this is going to show us some of her techniques and, and uh, processes. So this is one that I am working on. It's almost done. This one is six pieces. Yeah, six pieces. And then once again, the handles are um, extruded. And these are my favorite tools. And the ones that are marked with red have been with me since 93. <laughs> because I actually, when I first started the class here, my mom joined the class with me, and her tools were marked blue and mine were marked red. And my mom never sat at the pottery wheel, she would just hand build things. Um, but yeah, she took the first class with me. Uh, so I love, I love this one, and I always brush away all of the clay boogers, I call them. I use this graffito tool, pen tool, and then my people are always asking me, what do you do with the green scrubbies? This is my secret. Mm -hmm. the green scrubbies. And Jen Martin bought me vinegar. So I <laughs> went to Walmart. <laughs> um, I scratch and attach and because, once again, clay has a memory. After I attached my handles, I was having separation issues. And Jen Martin came up to the fourth floor and she said, what are you attaching with? And I said, slip. And she said, no. Um, so now I just uh, scratch and attach strictly with vinegar. No slip, no water, strictly vinegar. Um, and in between, this one, this one, um, because again, I'm working two other jobs. This one's taking me three weeks because um, I come in after work. And so that it doesn't dry out, I spray it with vinegar in between. So I have a bottom that's vinegar. I spray it with vinegar and I just have layers and layers and layers of plastic. Because again, if I, if I don't do that, it's, it's, it, wouldn't, it would not have lasted me three weeks for me to still be able to carve it. Um, but the vinegar, I realize that it makes the clay really, it makes it nice to carve. It does at the end, and this one is actually turning. It actually makes the pieces kind of green and moldy, um, the vinegar. But obviously that's all gonna burn out. So that's one of my secrets that I will share, the vinegar, and also the green scrubbies. Um, the green scrubbies, Please do not go cheap and buy them from the dollar store because they don't work. You must buy Scott brand. And I like them in different phases, right? I cut them in different sizes. And after I do the carvings, so my carvings start off with a line and then they go deeper. So I do the lot and then deeper with the stick. And then to make everything nice and smooth, I would just get one of the scrubbies and go in between my lines. And then the scrubbies, I wash them and I have a towel in my little section and I dry them because I want them to be different um, consistencies. Mm -hmm. If you feel them, there are some that are softer. Obviously this one is more worn, but when I want the, the clay to be removed from the spot, I'll use a harder one. And then at the end, I'll use a softer one and I buff with the softer mm -hmm. one. So that's how I get the surfaces nice and soft. So mm -hmm. I love, I have a bucket full of scrubbies. Um, and that's something that, again, I just learned by myself from trial and error. Uh, and you can notice the difference between th this carving and this carving. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's minor. Yeah. Can yeah. you tell us what the symbols mean on the one you're working yes. on? Yes. This one, um, my next series of vessels are going to be for exhibition um, reasons only. There's a lot of calls. I see on Instagram a lot of calls for artists to uh, have pots out on exhibition. And I want them all to be with diagonal symbols, right? Because that's the important part of me carving, me sharing my culture. So this one has six. This is one of their signs. This is one of their signs. This is part of the hurricane. This is the frog, it will eat. And this is another sign. And this one is just a mask. So when you pick those, so many suns and, and the frog, was it because I just the love shape the suns. I was gonna say, is it the shapes that you're attracted to? Or is there like a code that you're creating? No, or? I just like the suns. And this one is really popular. If you go to Puerto Rico, you and it, even if you go to Fifth Street, right here on Fifth Street, <laughs> it's called the Golden Block. So if you go all along Fifth Street, you'll find this one a lot. I don't know. Yeah, this 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 symbol here, you'll find this one a lot. I just like making this the, that one, and I like doing the poki. Um, and then I have a sheet that I reference. Um, and there aren't really any, you know, Tainos, real Tainos that are left to explain what that image is. So someone, 
um, took pictures and has kind of described them, them or her, herself. But they kind of make sense, right? This one here, it, they're calling it the crab. And it does look like a crab. This one here, they're calling it a snail. It does look like a snail. So I don't think that they're too far. Obviously, that's a turtle. There's one that's a hurricane. There's another sun. So, I mean, the person who took the picture, that's an octopus. And some of them are common, kind of common sense to me. And, and, you know, they're just obvious of what they are. And I just, again, um, I just want people to see the imagery and say, hey, why? What is that? Why? And then I can share my culture. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully people will visit the island and go check out mm -hmm. some stuff. And they're, you know, they you can tell that it's not a random pattern, which is what you're saying. Like you look at it and you think, okay, this is intentional. And then you give someone the opportunity to learn. Yes. That's so important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The same way my mom used the garden as her teaching tool, I use my pots. That's great. Okay, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Do you, for when applying the black glaze, do you brush it on? Yes. And then for the the one that has the brown coloring over here, is that just the clay wiped away? Yes. Okay, it's not a separate color. That's the clay. No, that's the clay body. I use the 104, with standard 104 with rock, and I like to apply it. And this one, I did the same thing. This one, I just left more of the black. I didn't wipe it as, as much. Um, and Daniel used to say that it leaves a patina mm -hmm. behind. So it all depends. If I wipe it a little, little bit, it leaves it like this. And then if I wipe more. But that's its own plot, right? That color makes it, that richness is from coming. No, that's regular, that's regular uh, O3. Low fire. Low fire. Low fire. I, I need really clay pendants. Oh. Just the clay pendants. I have not put one of these red vessels. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, not, not that one. The new ones I'm firing to a higher temperature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm scared to put a whole vessel I in, in five. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm scared Great. to put a whole thing in there. And I'm scared that it's going to bubble. It will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> After three weeks of working on one, I don't know. Um, so. I'm trying to convince Nessa that this stuff with these handles would be great as mugs. Don't you all want a mug like this? Oh, wow. She says she doesn't use mugs, so she's not making it. Um, <laughs> who else has a question? Anyone in Zoom land? Go ahead and put it in the chat. Yeah. I just have a question about the suns and the different suns. So do you know what they mean or what they symbolize or just that or like why they're called suns? No, it's just that they worship a lot. They just did a lot of suns or whoever found them just said, hey, that looks like a sun. Um, Nitsa has this book, um, Taino Pre-Columbian Art and Culture from the Caribbean. And um, there's been some articles lately that I've noticed coming up like in the New York Times about Taino culture and pottery. So it's something to think about. But I mean, it was occurring to me that hurricane, ocean things, suns, you know, this is what you have in Puerto Rico. This yeah, that's is their the, communication. This is the, well, it's the weather, it's their land. So mm -hmm. the fact that there's a symbol for a hurricane, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's the well, because there are lots of hurricanes there. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so it's, I would imagine it might be something with like, What's you know sunrise sunset? What kind of like I mean, I don't know, but it would be great to figure it out. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that there's people at that Taino museum. Yes, yeah. Part of your research trip when you go to Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, I think Robert had his hand up, and then Raymond. Uh. Actually, I don't even know what the silhouette of my vases are going to be. I don't even know what they're going to, what the shape looks like until I stack everything. So everything happens as it's happening. You know, some of them are shorter. Look at the, look at how round this belly is compared to the other bellies. It all depends. When I put the two bowls together, I said, "Oh, okay, that's what it's going." And then I just go from there. And the carvings, I don't pre-plan anything. Uh, is this what I feel in the moment? Mm 
Yeah. yeah. No, no. And then the <laughs> handles, the handles like oops, the handles I usually start, if you follow me on Instagram, I'll usually start with just a simple handle and then I'll go home, I take pictures. And on my camera, I'll draw the different okay. handles, okay. and then I'll come back and I'll keep adding to the handles. Because I never want my handles to be simple. But they start off simple. Huh. Oh, that's a great technique. That idea of using the picture to yes. add to. Yep. Yep. Great. Raymond? Oh, uh, I just want to know, did your mom come to the U.S. from Puerto Rico, or where she came from? She came as an adult. Um, so in my house, uh, in my household as a child, I only spoke Spanish. I didn't speak English until I started going to school. Mm -hmm. uh, in your in your process of working at your school site, like you know, like trial and error and that kind of thing, and is there a time when you're like, I'm so stumped, I need to reach out to somebody else? Or like, when do you approach another person to sort of like find the path, or do you find the path? Yeah, yeah, it's it, 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 it happened more, well, I created all of those on 2nd Street, and we were on the fourth floor, so that was on the fourth floor, so yes, uh, the, the uh, resident artists, Ruth and Chris, and again, Evan, um, and I forgot the other one that was in the corner that got married, that left, <laughs> his name. Wait, one of the residents? Mm -hmm. The got... one that was in the corner that, that got married. Alex? Alex. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, they were all there during the evenings, and yes, I would go to their cubbies and ask questions. <laughs> Do you have suggestions? What about this? So, and Alex actually witnessed the, the um, evolution of the shapes because he was there when they were, you know, wonky and wobbly, and yeah, yeah. And he gave me a lot of suggestions. Yeah, so it was awesome being with the resident artist on the fourth floor because we got a lot of feedback. As a matter of fact, Chris Chris says he's going to get a wheel and put it inside his little space because he misses me. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, and that's, I don't think we actually said it during this meeting, but that idea that you were, not only were you around artists, but you were around the art in the shop and the gallery. Yes. When you were, when we were kind of constricted into lockdown mm -hmm. and that that had an effect on on your work too. Oh, most definitely, most definitely, because running the Claymobile program, we were at the Crane, and I would only go to the Gap, I would only go to Second Street really every other Tuesday for that week. So I wasn't around the artist, um, I wasn't inside the shop, um, so that definitely made a difference. Uh, and then just having the ability of carving during my lunch, or coming in at 7 a.m. and being able to carve. At, when I was at the Crane, I didn't have that ability. Um, so yeah, during the lockdown, I drew a lot as an artist. And that really, to me, emphasizes the importance of the shop and the gallery um, as these sort of encyclopedias reference. Um, of reference for mm -hmm. any artist in the building and why we, part of why we designed this building so that you, all the students would at least part of the time be walking through the shop to get to their classrooms because there's inspiration in, in seeing the work of other artists and um, why when we talk about the shop and internally we understand that I think all of us in the building but when we're trying to explain it to maybe a granting organization or someone else it's like well it's not just a gift shop it's not just like a retail shop it's really a resource um, and that that's an important part of its mission yeah, which is important to me. Okay, other questions? I'm looking on the thing. Oh, you have another question? I have another question. Yeah. Um, so you said you don't plan things, but I guess while you were talking about your pieces and your process, I do you have an idea of when you throw the pieces, what they're going to look like, or do you do like a diagram ahead of time? You just really throw random pieces and then. <laughs> my, my, my concern, my concern is, do the mouths fit? Because <laughs> I still have, although I have calipers and I have different size calipers, my map, my, my, I'm still off on my sizing. So yeah, at nighttime I'm here just concentrating to make sure that this mouth will fit this mouth. And as, if it fits, yes, I'm happy. We'll go on to the next one. So again, I don't know what the end silhouette shape will be until I stack everything. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. 
Well, um, we have an awesome question from Dominique, as usual. She's always a great question answer. And hi, Dominique. Um, she asks, what are three goals? Mm, that's a lot. Um, what are your goals in general for your practice in the next few years? And we talked about that the other day. What's next? I want to go lighter. Lighter. Yes. In color or in, in lighter in weight. Weight. Okay. Yeah. I want to go I want to get lighter in weight and and I want to throw um, with a purpose. So so maybe draw it beforehand? Okay. Well, I, I don't know if drawing my figures works for me. Okay. Um, so what do you but, mean by but, but but definitely like when I sit at the wheel, I want to say, Okay, I'm gonna make a neck and make a neck. You know, sometimes that doesn't happen. Okay. Sometimes I may I try to make a neck and it turns into a bowl and then I have a bowl. <laughs> so I, <laughs> it's I'm a nice bowl. Good. I'm not that good yet where I can sit and say this I, I need this shape and make that shape. No, no, there's a lot of there's a lot of cursing. But <laughs> after after work there's a lot of cursing that happens after work. Yes. Um so yeah, my three goals would be to get lighter, to make them lighter in weight, mm -hmm. and to throw with a purpose. Uh -huh. Yeah, to get to that point where I can weigh my play and say, okay, this piece is going to, because people ask me, well, what, when you started your bowls, what did they weigh? I don't know. Because mm -hmm. I just cut the bag of clay in half and just start going. So I want to get to the point where if someone asks me, what, what did it start off with? I can, I can, you know, again, throwing with a purpose. That's a great goal. And then I'll add the third one is going on your trip to Puerto Rico. Yes. Because yeah. I have a fear of flying. So I don't go to Puerto Rico as often because I don't enjoy flying. So that would be something that it's I would medicine have medicine for that. Yeah, I have, to overcome, <laughs> I have to overcome that one because I definitely want to see this, this artist. Yeah. It's really important. Great. Okay, anybody else? Well, first featured artist, first clay in conversation. No one better than Nitsa to have both of those things. Thank you so much. I just want to. I just want to thank the Clay Studio uh, again. Uh, they opened the doors to me in '93. I've never been judged. Um, again, I'm operating with just a high school degree, and they've accepted me. I teach the Sunday class, the Sunday beginners class, so they've trusted me. Um, with my skills. So I want to thank the Clay Studio and because of them I'm able to work um, at Moore College of Art and I also work at Black Hound. Um, and again I could not have done either one of those if it weren't for the Clay Studio. Um, so I want to thank the Clay Studio and I also want to thank my mom. Um, she's a very important person in my life and has influenced me as a father. Thanks everyone in Zoom land. We appreciate you bearing with us in this new adventure. And we're so glad to have some people here in person too. So have a good day, everyone. Thanks for coming. Yeah, and my book is downstairs. Please sign.